works really, really well. It's really satisfying taking these ideas and having all this pure JavaScript do its job really well. So, um, uh, yeah, please welcome Nicholas. Myself. 
right, we'll just replace that last little part of space vehicle with web application, and it works the same. Right? Independent unit of functionality that's part of the total structure of the web application. So if you look at a page, um, this is my Yahoo, and I like to use this as an example because the modules are very obvious. Right? You can start to go through and just see like each of these little boxes is a separate module on the page. They actually don't have any relationship with any other module that's on the page, uh, except for the fact that they happen to be on the same page. And then you can go even further and start slicing out the rest and say that these are modules as well. Right? Just drawing little rectangles, little things that are independent pieces of functionality. So each web application module consists of HTML and CSS and JavaScript. So I'm focusing on JavaScript specifically, but I want you to keep this in mind. So any single module should be able to live on its own. That means literally I should be able to take any one of those boxes, take it out of the page that it's on right now, drop it onto another page, and it should just work. It should work exactly the same. There should be no errors. It should just work. And you accomplish this by using loose coupling in your code. So how many people have heard of loose coupling? Excellent. That's a large amount of people. Great. Uh, then maybe you'll understand the kind of silly photo that's behind it. So loose coupling allows you to make changes to one module without affecting the others, which is key. Right? You want to be able to send off people into far corners of the room, far corners of the building, far corners of the planet, have them work on their individual module, and have it not break mine or yours. And that's really key. So each module has its own sandbox. Uh, again, sandbox is also an overloaded term, so I apologize for that. Uh, in this context, it's going to mean an interface that the module uses to interact with the rest of the framework. And it really limits what the module has access to to make sure that loose coupling is enforced. So the sandbox basically sits on top of the application core. It just says, I'm the gatekeeper between what's possible on the page and what you're allowed to do. And then you have any number of modules that kind of hover around that. Right? It doesn't actually matter if you have one module or two or three or 20. Uh, they all kind of act the same way. Uh, and they interact with that sandbox. So the four parts of this architecture we're going to talk about are the modules themselves, the sandbox, the core, and the base library. So the modules are actually really dumb. They don't know much about what's going on on the page or about the framework itself, but knows about the sandbox only. That's its view into the world. So this is some really, really simple code. You guys read that from that? Yep. No? Yes. Yes? OK. Uh, well, if you can, the slides will be available online. Grab them afterwards. Uh, a lot of this is just kind of pseudocode to show you an example of what this might look like. Uh, I haven't implemented it for you. You're going to have to do that sometimes. Uh, but basically, you might register a module by giving it module name. Maybe you give it a function that executes uh, when it's ready, uh, and then pass in a sandbox object that is basically the interface to the rest of the world. And in this example, I have it returning an object that has an init method and a destroy method for setting up and tearing down that module. <coughs> so which parts know about the web application being built? So none of them. Right, I like to think of these modules as pieces of a puzzle. Right, no single piece of a puzzle actually knows what the larger picture is. So they just need to know that they interface with other puzzle pieces in a certain way. And as long as they're doing that correctly, eventually you'll end up with a picture. So what is a module's job? Right, well, if you're the weather module, it's your job to tell the user about the weather. And if you're a stocks module, then it's your job to tell the user about stocks. Basically, each module's job is to create a meaningful user experience within its own container. And it has to be self-contained so that it can live in multiple different places. 
And the web application is basically what gets created when you combine a bunch of modules in a specific way together. Right? Because again, each of these modules as puzzle pieces don't know what the larger web application is. Only we as users really know what a web application is. So that doesn't mean that the modules can do whatever they want, uh, because they might end up interacting with things that they shouldn't be, and that could affect other modules on the page or the overall page itself. So we have to think about modules as like little kids. Right? As they're great. They can run around and do all kinds of things and kind of pretend to be grown-ups, but if you don't give them the rules, they tend to get in trouble. So what are the rules? <clears throat> Hands to yourself. I only call methods that are on the sandbox. Don't access DOM elements outside of your box, right? because if you're responsible for just this one box that's on the page, then there's no reason for you to be going outside of that box to do anything. Right? That's all that you're concerned about. Don't access non-native global objects. So by that, I mean things like uh, window and document, uh, things that are actually page level versus module level. So ask, don't take. Uh, if there's something that you can't get access to, you go through the sandbox to try to get access to it. That will let you know if you're actually able to uh, access that or not. Don't leave your toys around. Uh, so don't create global objects. We all know that. And don't talk to strangers. So this is very important. In order for modules to remain separate, they can't know about each other. If the weather module is talking directly to the stocks module, and I remove one of them from the page, that means the other isn't going to work anymore. And that's what we're trying to avoid. <coughs> so modules need to stay within their own sandboxes, even though it may be uncomfortable. And it does get a little bit uncomfortable, because you're limiting what people have access to, and that usually idea about how this works. So what does a sandbox do? Uh, one is it provides consistency. Again, so modules can depend on that always being there. It doesn't matter what changes underneath that. Uh, and the last thing, which arguably is the most important, is communication. So take the time to design the sandbox correctly to start. Figure out exactly what you need. Go smaller if you need to. Uh, and add more later because you really can't change it. Now, the application core, little blue box here, uh, is actually what has the guts of the application itself. And that's what's controlling things on the page, basically controlling the module. And that's its only real job, is just to make sure that the modules are being managed, that they're being started, stopped, that they're doing the things that they should be doing. I also refer to this sometimes as the application controller, uh, especially when in the context of an MVC conversation. And so the application core will go through, will start modules, tell them that their life cycle has begun, and will go through later and stop them when their life cycle is over. Uh, so calling the init or destroy, depending on the timing. It may end up looking like this. Uh, if you register your module, you might just start, and I'm not going to go through each of these lines through line, you can grab the slides afterwards. Uh, but basically, when you're starting a module, creating a new sandbox and passing it in, uh, and then when you're stopping, just destroying that module at the other end. <coughs> and then you, it's usually helpful to have a start all and a stop all, because that tends to happen quite frequently. Uh, and then basically, how you create your application is by registering a bunch of different modules right, all in a row and then calling start, which then goes through and starts up the life cycle for each of those modules, and therefore the entire application. So the application core manages the communication between the modules. So the sandbox is what allows the modules to communicate <coughs> between one another, but the core is actually what handles that communication. So why do you need this intermodule communication when I was just saying that the modules have to be completely separate? Well, it's because even though they're separate, they sometimes need to know what others are doing. Now, this is old Twitter, obviously, uh, but it was a really good example of how modules would need to communicate with one another. So if we split this up into some modules, we could say this is one, this is one, this is one, this, 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 that, okay. So basically, we had a bunch of modules on the page. 
the, the top is actually setting the status, and the bottom is the time run. Now, you actually don't want these two talking directly to one another, but they do have a relationship. Right? Because when you update your status, then that causes your timeline to update. And then when you try to hit things on the side, you're basically filtering the timeline, so the timeline is also updating. There are a few of those, right? You do search and whatever. Uh, and so you might end up writing code that looks like this. And so you have a timeline filter object, uh, and then on change filter, that's calling timeline, there's a status poster object, uh, and when that changes the status, it tells the timeline, uh, and then timeline just has a couple of methods that other things are calling, right? So this is bad, because this is a very tight coupling. When objects know about one another directly, that means that changing one of them means that you have to change the other very, very frequently. Uh, and that could be a huge pain. So what can you do instead? Well, the sandbox kind of marshals this notification mechanism. So a lot of people have heard about the observer pattern, yes? Okay, people who are awake have heard of the observer pattern. <laughs> Uh, so there's a close cousin to the observer pattern called the mediator pattern, and it's slightly different in that there's one object that is controlling the messages for everything. So all that you need to know is that the mediator object exists, and it will handle all the transactions in between a bunch of different objects. So that's what the sandbox is implementing here. We have, uh, when the filter is changed, we have sandbox notify, and it's just saying, hey, the timeline filter changed. I'm just letting you know that the timeline filter changed in case you happen to care about that and want to do something in response to that. And also, uh, for the status poster, we're doing the same thing. I, I posted a new status. Just wanted to let you know. If you want to do something with it, that's cool. If you don't, that's fine too. Just letting you know that this thing has happened. And that's an example of loose coupling, because the sandbox is owned by the module. And even though there are some relationships between the modules who need to know when data changes, uh, they don't know about each other directly. And there's an intermediary, the sandbox, in the middle. And so what you might want to do is also have a listen method in another module that says, OK, these are the messages that I'm interested in receiving uh, when they happen to pop up in the application. And so again, instead of talking to the status poster or the timeline directly, or the filter directly, all it's doing is just saying, hey, when there's this message with this name, I'm interested in it, and call this function for it. So when modules are loosely coupled this way, removing the module doesn't break others. So if the old Twitter was made this way, you could remove the timeline, and everything would continue to work without any errors. And you wouldn't see the updates in the timeline, but that's okay. You could swap in something else instead. Uh, this also gives you the opportunity to create an entirely new module uh, that behaves or looks completely different, that uses the same data that's just already flowing through the system. <coughs> so the application core also handles errors. And it can use information it has at the time about the context, to figure out exactly what the right thing to do is uh, for that error. So here, what I'm basically doing is wrapping each of the methods that are on the modules in some try-catch statements, so that when an error occurs, I can be notified of that in the way that I want, and I can do something appropriate. So usually I have two modes for this. One is debug mode, where it just throws the error in your face so you know that there actually was an error. And then one I like to call production mode, right? Where you don't actually want to pop up an error in front of the user because that would be scary. Uh, but you do want to try to handle it and then tell yourself somehow that there was an error. Uh, I usually recommend to people that they log their JavaScript error back to the server just so they can be aware of what's going on. Uh, and I did a whole talk actually on a JavaScript error handling a couple of years back that covers all the things that I just talked about. Uh, in greater detail. Uh, do you guys know the difference between JavaScript error handling and enterprise JavaScript error handling? No? Well, you can't give a talk on JavaScript error handling. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it has to be enterprise JavaScript error handling. 
So the application core job, and just to review, is to manage the module lifecycle, uh, enable the intermodule communication via the mediator pattern, do some general error handling, and be extensible is a really important part of any application framework. Uh, maybe that should be why, not why. Uh, because web applications change dramatically, even over short periods of time. I'm sure you guys know this. Uh, so this is the Yahoo homepage right, a few years ago and just recently. Changed very dramatically. Uh, and you want the code that you've written to actually last. So I tend to tell people that when you write code, <coughs> you should try to make it last for five years. Ooh. <laughs> That's a really long time. How could my code possibly last for five years? Like, well, if you're rewriting your code every few months, you're actually wasting a lot of time. Uh, but if you write your code and say, hey, this has to last for five years, you start to make more intelligent decisions about how you're separating things out, right? Will this change? Is this a piece of functionality that's going to change? If so, I should abstract that out somehow so I can swap it back in later. So plan for extension whenever you can. Uh, there is a very brilliant thing that happened, I don't know, maybe it's a decade ago now, uh, when digital cameras first started coming out. So I'm not talking about like the little pocket cams, I'm talking about like a Canon, like digital rebel, really strong ones. They came out and they had the same body as the film cameras did. I said, well that's nice. Well it's really nice because there's an army of photographers throughout the world that have bought all kinds of expensive lenses and contraptions for their film cameras and they weren't going to switch over if they had to rebuy all of them. So by creating digital cameras that were the same size and same shape as the film cameras, everybody could continue to use all of those extensions that they had, all of those different uh, lenses that they had. It was brilliant. Uh, and that's how you should be building your web application. Right? Because things change. They change frequently. Uh, and if you ever stop and say to yourself, well, I know that this isn't going to change in the next six months, you're probably not these extensions. But you need to be able to add new functionality into that core at any point in time. So what sort of extensions? Well, for error handling, maybe you want to have something that is sending errors back to the server, maybe you don't, maybe you want to be doing something else. Uh, AJAX communication is actually a really big one. Uh, new module capabilities as well. Like maybe the modules initially aren't allowed to do something and you want to enable that, so you can just pop in an extension and all of a sudden allow that to propagate to the system. And of course, any general utilities as well. So if you want to add any sort of little helpers in there that do common things that people are doing very frequently, that's a good place to add as well. Uh, really anything. You want to make sure that the application core when you start out is just managing modules, uh, and then everything else you just add extensions to it until it's doing everything that you need it to. So let's stop and talk about AJAX communication a little bit. Uh, this is one of those things that absolutely, absolutely must be abstracted uh, in your application framework. And that's because it comes in so many different shapes and sizes. Right? And there's basically three things that you always need to have for every uh, AJAX request. Uh, you have your request format, you have an entry point on the server, and you have your response format. Now those three parts always have to be in sync in order for your request to work. If one of those goes out of sync, then nothing works anymore. And so, I always say abstract out your AJAX communication. So maybe we started out, you know, several years ago doing XML for AJAX. So we had an AJAX XML extension. We say, okay, so the request format is just a query string pretty much. It's going to slash AJAX, and it's giving me back some XML. Okay, super great. So, <clears throat> doing this with just a regular XHR object, that's a lot of code to write. And everybody that's writing a module has to do some AJAX communication, and they're all writing this. And that means that if any one of these things changes, then everybody has to go back and change their code that's all doing this. Big pain. So there's the entry point, the request format, and the response format. Okay, all embedded within the JavaScript. So if you're using a library, this one is using YUI. Uh, things are a little bit better. Right? You're not going so super low level. 
uh, you're using a little bit of an abstraction to make callbacks a bit easier. But you still have the entry point and the request format and the response format in there. So even just using the library itself doesn't free you up. What you actually want is something like this. Right, where you're saying, I'm making a request. Here's the data that I'm sending in. And this is the data that I'm expecting to get out. Right? None of the three are here. There's no entry point, there's no request format, there's no response format. It's hiding all of those details because now I can swap that out underneath and this code doesn't actually have to change. <coughs> so the HS extension basically encapsulates those three pieces, the request format, the entry point, and the response format. So that means at any point in time, I can go in and change that for everything that's on the page and it just works. You don't actually have to go back into the modules and change them individually, you change it one spot. So now I just decided I'm going to change the entry point to slash request, and I'm going to change the response format to JSON, and everything just continues to work because there's a new extension that's piping things back into the framework in the generic format that it had defined. So we added it back in over there. So the AJAX extension jobs uh, hide the AJAX communication details. Right, we don't want any of that exposed to module developers themselves. A provided common request interface, so again, abstracting away the request format, the response format, uh, and manage server failures too. So when you're dealing with an application, it's not always just like a 500 or a 404 that you're worried about. Uh, you might actually get a 200 response back, uh, but that response might have garbage in it. It might have XML, it might have HTML, and you're expecting JSON. And what do you do about that? They always say that you should check that the format you receive back is what you're actually expecting. And if not, then you should just tell people, uh, tell the developers to fire the failure handler instead. Because you don't really care why you didn't get what you were expecting, just that you didn't get it. So the last part is the base library. And this just provides basic functionality. It's very simple. And these are the libraries that we all know and love. They abstract away browser differences for us, all great. Um, most applications are way too tightly tied to their base library. Right? Everybody wants to use their jQuery, everybody wants to use their YUI. Uh, that's all fine and good, but it creates a lot of maintenance headaches uh, as your application continues to grow. Uh, so Joseph Smarr gave this talk at OSCON several years ago uh, called High Performance JavaScript, which has absolutely no relationship to my high performance JavaScript stuff. Uh, his unfortunately came first, but we don't mention that. <laughs> but in his talk, he had a really interesting idea where he said you should be using these base libraries, JavaScript libraries, as scaffolding for your application. Uh, you get it up and running, and then you don't actually need to use it so much because you've built up a little framework that's doing most of the important jobs for you. Uh, and that was where you can find the slides. Again, mine are already up on SlideShare, so you can check that out later. So ideally, only the application core has any idea what the base library is. And I say ideally uh, because we rarely deal with ideal situations with applications. Uh, usually, after I give this talk, people come up to me and say, well, I can't abstract away like, my JavaScript library completely. I say, fine, don't. It's OK. Uh, what you're trying to do, though, is you're trying to create the opportunity for developers to more quickly and easily implement things that are common in your application. That's really the idea. They can't do that if they're always going down and using the very low-level functionality provided in the JavaScript library. And you want them at a higher level doing things that actually have uh, meaning to your business rather than trying to figure out which method on jQuery should be used in order to do one thing or another. So the, the really cool thing about that, if you manage to abstract it away, is that at any point in time, you can decide to swap out your base library. But you could start with Dojo and decide later, oh, I want to switch to YUI. And if that's abstracted, it really doesn't matter. And there could be any number of reasons that you would do something like this. But you just want to give yourself the option as much as possible. So the base library jobs, browser normalization, is really important. That's what the JavaScript library should be doing above all else. 
Uh, general purpose utilities, of course, any partial serializer, that sort of thing, uh, any OO type of stuff, DOM manipulation, uh, low level AJAX, all that sort of stuff. Low level extensibility, of course, the libraries themselves are extensible. So you end up with an overall architecture that looks like this. So to wrap up, I just want to talk a little bit about uh, what parts of the architecture know about what other parts of the architecture. Right, so this is what the entire picture looks like. Okay, so the base library is the only part of the architecture that knows which browser is being used. You want that completely abstracted away from the application level JavaScript. Only the application core knows which base library is being used. Right? Everything else shouldn't need to know about that. <coughs> Only the sandbox knows which core is used. And so you could also swap that out at some point in time, decide you have a better implementation and change it completely. And the sandbox would have to change, but nothing else would have to change. And then the modules don't know anything except that the sandbox exists. They don't know about one another. They don't know about anything beneath the sandbox. So you could completely replace everything underneath there. Uh, and all the modules should continue to just work. And no part knows about the web application. Because remember, each piece, uh, each module is just like a puzzle piece. It doesn't really know what the entire picture is. The picture is formed by putting them all together, and then that creates an experience for you that you say is the web application. So the advantages of this, uh, you have multiple different applications created with the same framework. You can literally take this, the core and the base library build something over there, and then go and take that same stuff and build something over there. And you can also take modules and transplant them back and forth. Each part can also be tested completely separately. A lot of times we run into problems trying to test a front end code because there are such tight dependencies on base libraries or on other things that are existing. Uh, just in the general JavaScript execution environment. This allows you to create things as is that a scalable JavaScript architecture allows you to replace any block within a Jenga tower and have it not fall over. And it's built in such a way that you can go in, mix and match the different pieces, uh, and have things continue to work. Because ideally what happens is you end up with a library of like dozens of modules that you can slap in on any page at any point in time. Uh, and you need those to continue to work no matter what happens. Uh, and you can go in and change the core or the base library or any of that stuff. And it's completely, uh, the modules themselves are completely oblivious to the changes underneath. Everything just continues to work. <laughs> and that's what will allow a lot of your code to continue to work for five years after you've written it. And that is all I have to say. We've got um, four minutes for questions, so um, we can take yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, four minutes for questions. Sure. Um, by the way, findshare.net slash nzakis is where you can find the slides for this. I have to go a little bit down because this talk Given two years ago, and it should be. That's all up there. <laughs> so I have um, two questions. Well, two points. What, what is it? Um, I, I like Raise to, your hand. All right. Okay. okay. Uh, I like to mess with your metaphor a little bit because I think the module has its own sandbox. That's the place that you play in. And the thing that you pass into the module <coughs> is the sandbox bridge, it's the thing that you use to get out. No, you're right. That's, that's why I apologize a couple of times for semantics because you know, everybody yeah. describes these things slightly differently. Okay. Um, it, it Yes, 
I'm going to get you. Sorry, what was the last part of that? Uh, so you're creating your own version of the baseline here in the application. Um, so why? I mean, um, it's presumably has slightly less documentation, slightly less tested. Uh, I mean, what does that really get you? Yeah, so what this basically gets you is a layer of abstraction so that you can change it later if you need to. But the interesting thing uh, about that application core is it frequently it just delegates to the base library directly. But you usually don't use as much of the base library as you think. So a lot of times people are like, oh my god, I need access to my jQuery. Like, that's great. And then I go and look at their code, and they're using actually very little, uh, you know, a very small number of methods. So what you end up doing is you don't start out and abstract everything that's in your base library, that would be a complete waste of time. Um, but you start by saying, what are the common tasks that developers need to do? And let's abstract that so that they can actually do it better. Because there are a lot of things, um, for example, one of the things that I found uh, when I was doing this the first time was that every single module developer was going in and the first thing they were doing, absolutely the first thing they were doing, defining an on-click event handler for the module. And that was the first thing they were doing. So we changed it so that basically on-click was automatically added for them. And they didn't have to do that. And that also meant that they didn't have to go and touch the JavaScript library's way of adding event handlers anymore. It just wasn't necessary. And so I guess the, the short answer is that by abstracting it up, uh, it, you, get, you get to do things that are a little more specific to the developer's needs. Uh, and actually, Remy and I were having this conversation last night where he said when he was doing it, well, I still have some jQuery stuff popping through. I was like, okay, cool. Like, if, if people actually need access to the low-level stuff uh, and you can't figure out a way to abstract it, then go ahead. One more. And if you're using your mediator, do you ever use your mediators as a state machine sort of thing to do transitions? And if you do, they have growth, it would be on really a difficult unit test. Uh, have you ever used mediator for state transitions? Um, I have, <laughs> but not, not to such a degree that I've run into a problem with it. I mean, there are, I mean, thinking more about like single page apps where you're switching from like one context to the next and so on. Um, yeah, in that case, I would probably not use the mediator to do that specifically. I would probably create an extension that manages the uh, overall application state and just allow the, uh, the individual module to say like, hey, I am doing something now that should be changing the state, and then have the state manager come in and actually do it. In, in your very view diagram with all the modules around the sandbox and the extensions around the application core, where does the piece fit that ties it all together into the little web application? This one here, yeah. So the piece fits that ties it all together, um, just what you see, pretty much. So it's how the modules interact with one another that creates the web application. What you end up doing is, uh, instead of having you know, an overall like application object, you just uh, output onto the page each of the modules, and then at the bottom, just have the application core start them all. And by virtue of them all starting, and each of the modules doing their correct job, that's actually what creates the web application. Uh, it's, it's a little bit esoteric, but. Okay.